this point, whether you think the last few years of Metal Gear Solid have been a waste of time or not, it's safe to say that we'd all be interested to see more works from Hideo Kojima that aren't part of his never-ending stealth series. And now that it looks like we're finally going to have that wish granted, I figured this would be a good time to take a look back at some of the man's non-Metal Gear work. Before I'd played Snatcher, the only thing I really knew about it was that it was that one Mega CD game people seemed to think was actually not that bad. Little did I know that this version of Snatcher, the first to be localized in the West, was actually just a port, with the original having been released six years prior on the MSX2 and PC-8801 or something. One year after the original Metal Gear. And that kind of puts into perspective what a different mindset Kojima must have been in back then. Snatcher loosely ties into the events of the original Metal Gear with the odd continuity nod and recurring characters. I'll get into that more later, but what I'm trying to say is, when Kojima finished Metal Gear, a game about sneaking into a military base, the first thing he did was not make a sequel, but instead create a brand new IP set decades later with completely different gameplay and tone about a detective in a cyberpunk Japan hunting down body snatchers. That, I think, is the legend we want to see resurface again. Snatcher is a story-driven adventure game, and the opening does a spectacular job at getting one pumped to get immersed in the gritty future it presents. Titles like this are a good example of how consoles like the Mega CD should have been used. Instead of cramming loads of horribly compressed full-motion videos onto the extra space a disc offers, what we get here is a game with the stylish pixel art of its age combined with the crisp sound a CD can provide. Immediately, the jazzy tunes of Snatcher just hit you like no regular console game of the time could have hoped for. From a modern perspective, the contrast of the old-school visuals with high-quality audio makes for a striking combo. I think audio goes underrated in Kojima's games. It wasn't just the cinematography and graphics of games like Metal Gear Solid that made their polish pop out at people, it was how awe-inspiring and dignified the sound could be that brought a whole new level of respect to Kojima's work. Even the clickety-clacks of the menus were above average. I think this is probably a good moment, though, to point something a little awkward out when it comes to Kojima's games, and especially this one. Metal Gear is pretty evident inspired by a lot of different sources, but the word inspired becomes almost a bit too lenient when it comes to some of the things Snatcher lifts from other properties. Yeah, the game is basically Blade Runner from top to bottom. There's no getting around it. These cities, the buildings, guy in a trench coat hunting down body snatchers, there's this bit here that's pretty Akira. And okay, this kind of thing brings into question just how much of what makes Snatcher so cool can be attributed to Kojima. But saying that, if anime Blade Runner is what you're offering up, I mean, sounds good to me, I'm all over it. You just gotta love the stylistic choices in a game like Snatcher. Every room is just capital letters future as hell. Like, jeez man, seriously, is all this stuff necessary for your office? Anyway, if you haven't garnered the basics from my Blade Runner comparison, you play a detective tasked with hunting down the Snatchers. Robots with advanced AI that disguise themselves as humans to live amongst society before enacting their treacherous deeds. In this case, we take control of Gillian Seed, the new guy in the block who, after being discovered with no memory three years ago in Siberia alongside his also amnesiac wife, has taken up the role as a junker to rid the streets of these undercover fiends. Immediately, the game does a swift enough job of introducing you to your crew as, uh, as well as your sidekick. Metal, introduce yourself. Yes, sir. Pleased to meet you, Gillian. I am Metal Gear Mach 2. I gotta admit, it's stuff like this that really makes me wish I could have played these titles as they were coming out. I can't imagine how cool it must have been to see a small little buddy Metal Gear be introduced all the way back when Snatcher came out, only to see the same kind of model make a reappearance two decades later in Metal Gear Solid 4. Unlike the Wii guy in that game though, the Metal Gear in Snatcher has its own artificial intelligence. And I gotta say, the banter between the self-serious deviant that is Gillian and this little matter-of-fact robot was definitely one of the game's highlights. I can't believe you did! that, Gillian? Uh, well, uh, you see, I was just... Face up to it like a man. You shut up. I'm just glad that you're safe, Katrina. It's not long before things kick off and we're sent on our first mission to crack down on the Snatcher menace. As adventure games go, Snatcher's methods of interaction are pretty simplistic. The player just basically scrolls through a menu of options, picking up what to examine and, if possible, choosing which screen to move to next. With all the options just sort of there, the game just kind of boils down into clicking on every option until the choice that progresses the story appears. It's basic stuff, but it does pretty much make getting stuck very hard to do. 
and means for the most part there's no bullshit screen hunting like there is in a lot of adventure games. Soon enough we'd run into f oh, shitting hell. This is one gruesome scene for such an old game. It's funny to think that today, when violence in video games is a far more accepted facet of the medium, that the Metal Gear games, as action-packed as they are, have never gone as far as to feature straight-up decapitation as far as I remember. Oh my god. This is a really good opening mission, and kicks off the mystery that needs to be solved pretty effectively. The Snatchers are planning something big, and with a few clues provided, it's time to hit the town and figure out just what that may be. Unfortunately, this is where things start to slow down, and it becomes apparent that the investigating process in Snatcher is gonna be a bit of a slow one. A lot of early sections of the game require use of the Junker database to acquire the answers Gillian needs, which forces the player to return all the way to HQ to look anything up. The funniest thing about future science science fiction that takes place in our world is all the little things that are predicted in terms of technology that end up being completely inaccurate. I mean, how silly is it that today in the real world we can look up any piece of information on our phones, but in 2047, Paul Gillian has used this giant-ass computer to answer simple history questions. At least the video phone can be used anywhere. Even Blade Runner was behind the times on that one with its payphone video calls. I'm not gonna say the phone is perfect though either. Mess up in putting a number in, uh, get ready to watch this every time. The number you have reached is not in service at this time. Please check the number and dial again. This is a recording. JTNT Neo Kobe. <laughs> Unskippable, baby. While in concept, the use of menus to navigate an adventure game does cut down on busy work, Snatcher still seems to go out of its way to delay progression. Nothing that should be achievable with one command, like opening a door or simply moving to the next area, can be accomplished without first looking and investigating for whatever the game randomly deems necessary before the command the player wants comes into being. Like, I get it, they're in the shower. Can we not go over there? Can, can we do something? And it's this kind of stuff that just makes me wish Snatcher was a game where I was an actually player character moving around in a real interactive environment. I do really like how the shooting segments appear out of nowhere. It makes me actually feel a bit like a cop on the job who could get attacked at any moment. It doesn't change how simplistic they are, but they're infrequent enough to not outstay their welcome while remaining novel when they pop up. Thing is, while the shooting galleries are mostly the same every time, without spoiling anything, some of the scenarios they present are pretty creative and cool. All I'm saying is that they would make for some sick Metal Gear style boss fights if they were in 3D with a few more mechanics. Like a just imagine the camera panning around Gillian after a cutscene before launching into an epic snatcher battle. One of the reasons I'd like more opportunity to move around this world more fluidly is because of how inviting and realized snatcher is. The art really brings the place to life, even in the still shots of pixel work we see. While the dystopic future cities in Blade Runner and Akira present worlds you really sort of don't want to live in, Snatcher is way tamer in this regard and presents a future with issues and certainly terrors, but one that would still feel comfortable enough to inhabit given the right circumstances. And if there's one thing I can give Snatcher, it's one comfy game. This is the kind of game you just want to get all cozy up in bed while you play, solving them mysteries. See, it's even set around Christmas, comfiest time of the year. Yeah, you see, this is a Christmas episode, isn't it? It's not tenuous. What are you doing in that outfit? What are you talking about? The music really adds to the atmosphere. The moody, sci-fi evoking tracks play up the noir tone of the story. Sometimes a little too much. Like, this must be the spookiest vet I've ever been in. A lot of the charm of Snatcher comes from the little details. <laughs> like, you can totally call up Gillian's ex-wife at any time and ask her out on a date. And even though she always says no, there are like a million ways she can be asked. Stuff like hidden love lines and just the quirky little options the game lets a player take from time to time lend the title its charisma. One location is the Outer Heaven Bar, where a bunch of clients masquerade as Konami characters, and Gillian spouts some pretty spitting commentary on video game politics of the time, and maybe even today. <laughs> oh man, wasn't it cool when Konami had franchises to put in a room like this? But all kidding aside, it is a pretty funny section. Things do pick up after the first act, where the investigation starts coming together and a new badass character, Random Hajil, shows up. The resident snatcher bounty hunter of the piece. Wow. Gillian, records indicate that he has already disposed of three snatchers just this month. Who, as the game goes on, becomes pretty legendary in his own way. The ties to Metal Gear become super apparent, not just with the inclusion of 
Metal Gear, but other characters who are directly tied to members of those games' cast. But I really don't want to spoil it. If there's one weird Metal Gear parallel which is pretty shocking in its relevancy now, it's Act 3 of the game. Remember when I said the Mega CD version of Snatcher was released years after the game originally came out on old-ass Japanese computers we never had? Well, back then, the game in fact didn't include a third act. Yeah, the ending of the game was missing until years later when it launched on the PC Engine. And doesn't the lack of a third chapter sound, uh, eerily familiar? I guess as things change, the more they stay the same. It sort of makes me have to reevaluate my opinion on Snatcher, though, because the version I'm playing did come out six years after the game's first outing. If years from now a finished version of Phantom Pain released with a complete story, I can't say I'd feel any better about the game. I guess being born in the West years after a title's release lets me bypass that quandary when it comes to Snatcher somewhat. But I still feel bad for those Japanese players who got screwed over, even if I can't really put myself in their shoes. All that said, in retrospect, Act 3 is kind of hilarious. Don't get me wrong, it's cool, it wraps up the story really well. Funny thing is, the chapter reflects the design Kojima implements way more in his games today than back when Metal Gear and the first two acts of Snatcher were made. The act has very little gameplay and the whole thing concludes with a massive 30 minute cutscene. And yep, yeah, this is it. This is when the legend behind the cutscenes in these games was born. And I'm not gonna lie, what they do here is pretty crazy. But as is the case with most Metal Gear games, also pretty awesome. Snatcher is a sick little adventure game, and while its gameplay has certainly aged, its brilliant aesthetics and soundtrack still have a lot of charm today. A return to the universe is certainly impossible now, but there are a few other allusions to Snatcher made throughout more of Kojima's work. There's an entire other game, in fact. Super Deformed Snatcher, that takes a top-down, cartoony, JRPG approach to the story that included a third act before the re-release of the main title ever did. The biggest reference in Metal Gear, of course, are the similarities between the Metal Gear and Snatcher and the Mark II from MGS4. Though in that game, of course, it's controlled by Otacon or manually by the player if they so desire. Act 3 is where they kick the references up a notch by having snaked on a younger looking Octo Camo and swim around a noir city with a trench coat similar to Gillian's. And so I get to live out my fantasies of a fully controllable Gillian for a few short levels. More recently, in Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes, there was an unlockable mission that tasked the player to use Cyborg Raiden to hunt down a bunch of snatchers on a military base for a bit of casual fun. The mission falls pretty flat, though, since since it tries to have its cake and eat it by paying homage both to Snatcher and Metal Gear Rising, with the whole thing boiling down to a small hunt and a shootout at the end. The last time Snatcher got any dedicated media to itself was a radio drama prequel about a previous junker on the Snatcher case, written by Suda51 with music by Akira Yamaoka. <laughs> I don't even know, man. Snatcher may be permanently gone for good now, with Kojima out of Konami, probably was with him there either way, but, well, there really isn't actually a but to this now that I think about it. Can't even get the game on a digital service or anything, it's just straight up gone, really. I mean, there was a PlayStation port in Japan with a CG opening. <laughs> While Snatcher sold pretty poorly in the West, only releasing on Mega CD with a restrictive mature rating, I could see something like this doing well today. With the popularity of stuff like the Telltale Adventure games and other interactive narrative titles, but back then, wrong place, wrong time. Yeah, there's no silver lining to this one. But Snatcher's slick style will still remain in my heart. And all I can hope for now is that Kojima can finally return to an age where he made more than just one thing. So maybe a title as cool as Snatcher can come along again. Snatcher may be permanently gone for good now with Konami out of Kojima. <laughs> Konami out of okay. <laughs>